Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless is pope francis the false prophet spoken of in the book of revelation the false prophet of the end times together with the antichrist and satan who empowers both of them will complete the unholy trinity of the end times the false prophet is depicted as having horns like a lamb while speaking like a dragon, meaning he sounds like Jesus, the lamb, but speaks like a dragon, Satan. The false prophet's mission on earth is to force humanity to worship the Antichrist. He has all the authority of the Antichrist because like him, the false prophet is empowered by Satan. Whoever the false prophet turns out to be, the final world deception and the final apostasy will be great and the whole world will be caught up in it. The deceivers and false teachers we see today are the forerunners of the Antichrist and the false prophet, and we must not be deceived by them. These false teachers abound, and they are moving us toward a final satanic kingdom. We must faithfully proclaim the saving gospel of Jesus Christ and rescue the souls of men and women from the coming disaster. Pope Francis continued his outreach to the LGBTQ community, declaring in a new interview that homosexuality is not a crime and laws against it are unjust. The 86-year-old leader of the Catholic Church is the first pope to reach out to the gay community, saying homosexual acts are a sin, but emphasized that it's also a sin to lack charity with one another. The pope has not changed his stance against same-sex marriage. The pope saying in this interview also, we are all children of God, and God loves us as we are. The Pope saying in this interview also, We are all children of God, and God loves us as we are. We are all children of God, and God loves us as we are. What does it mean to be a child of God? 1 John 3.10 explains what it means to be a child of God. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God nor is he who does not love his brother. The life of a child of God will be completely different from the life of the unsaved. A child of God has a desire to live in a way that pleases the Heavenly Father, as we read in 1 Corinthians 10.31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Many people wrongly believe that everyone is a child of God. The Bible teaches us this is not true. We can only become his children when we believe in the name of Jesus Christ, as we read in John 1.12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. 2 Corinthians 5.17 describes what happens when we are born again into the family of God through faith in Jesus. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Jesus taught that becoming children of God means we must experience a new birth, as we read in John 3.3. 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. A child of God is no longer a child of the devil, and God sets about transforming his children through the power of the Holy Spirit, as we read in Romans 8.13 and 14. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. If we do not begin to look like our Heavenly Father in word, desire, and action, we are most likely not really His, as we read in 1 John 2, 3, and 4. Now by this we know that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. He who says, I know Him, and does not keep His commandments, is a liar and the truth is not in him. Human beings were created to live as children of God. Sin marred that purpose and broke that bond with him. Christ restores us to that original relationship. For all eternity, the sons and daughters of God will worship him 
as one united family, as we read in Revelation 7, 9, and 10. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. A child of God lives for him on earth, and eagerly awaits a future with him in heaven, as we read in Philippians 3.20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Andrew Brunson is an American pastor who ministered in Turkey for more than 20 years. In 2016, Turkish police arrested Brunson on false charges. For more than two years, he suffered in Turkish prisons or house arrest. His book, God's Hostage, a true story of persecution, imprisonment, and perseverance, chronicles that ordeal. Now Brunson believes he has a message for the church. I learned throughout my time in prison uh, how important it is to Jesus that we be able to share a number of things that are on his heart. And one of the ways to to access those, to get to know his heart, is to go through some of the things that he went through. Part of that is hardship. So I went through some difficulties, but I realized that every time I went through something that Jesus experienced, I got a little taste of it. it, it brought my heart into a little more overlap with his heart. Because of the days we're living in, is this a message for the church at this time? Well, I think the message for the church, especially right now, is know your God. My pursuit of, of the heart of God, of drawing close to Him and knowing Him, is what best prepared me for the difficulties that I faced in prison. James 4, 7 through 10. Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. So it was my love for him that fueled endurance, that helped me to be faithful, that helped me to push through and not quit, even when I felt very broken. And so uh, how do we best prepare for hardship? If we know our God, well, the Bible says in Daniel 11:32. The people who know their God shall stand and accomplish exploits. So sometimes we're really focused on the exploits, accomplishing things, but the priority right now should be know your God so that as that wave of persecution, wave of pressure comes, we remain standing. In these days now, do you see a likelihood of more persecution and more pressure? I think it's very clear that it's coming. It's very much on my heart. Just God is. I think one of the things God was doing with me in my imprisonment and, and allowing me to break the way he did is that I had to learn how to strengthen myself in difficult circumstances so that I could stand and be faithful. Part of that was some of the things that I've learned are transferable to other people. And so, yes, I think that this is an assignment I feel from God right now is to help people to prepare to stand in what I think is coming. Mm. And it is, and not only in the United States. It is going to come to the United States, which is unusual, unexpected. We haven't had it there before. That means that many of us are not prepared for it. It's not part of our worldview. But we're just going into a period of greater darkness and trouble in the world in general. And we need to prepare our hearts so that when the shaking is happening, that we stand. Getting closer to Him is the way we can prepare for those dark times. Well, there are other things we can do as well, but that is the foundation for everything else. Mm -hmm. Know Him. If you know Him, if you love Him, 
then you're going to be willing to pay the price that you may have to pay to be faithful to him. Would you pray right now for those people who may be looking and watching and viewing and how they can prepare? Yeah, so I, then I will pray what I prayed for myself in prison so many times. Father God, mm. I pray for us, your sons and daughters. Pour out on us, your sons and daughters, the, the spirit of Jesus. Pour out on us the confidence, the strength, the hope, the perseverance, endurance, and steadfastness of Jesus so that we may run the race set before us and finish well. A beautiful bride purified in the fires of faithful obedience, tested and found worthier for beloved of Jesus, the King of glory. So that's what we need is for the spirit of Jesus to be poured into us so that we can endure like he did. Amen. Jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Christians would be persecuted as we read in Matthew 24, 9 and Luke 21, 12. Matthew 24, 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Luke 21, 12. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. 1 Corinthians 16.13 Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Raising the stakes in Ukraine, the U.S. and Western allies will be shipping battle tanks to the war zone to help the Ukrainian military. The challenge is to get the tanks to the battlefield in time for a spring offensive. The bold move has sparked a hostile response from the Russians who are calling it blatant provocation. CBN's Brody Carter reports. As the war in Ukraine approaches its second year, the United States and Germany have upped their ante in support of Ukraine now sending tanks to help fight the Russians. I'm announcing that the United States will be sending 31 Abram tanks to Ukraine, the equivalent of one Ukrainian battalion. NATO allies are also sending help. The UK has pledged to send 14 of its Challenger 2 battle tanks. Germany is releasing 14 Leopard 2 tanks, with up to 60 more Leopards coming from other countries. Peter Rowe with the Hudson Institute believes the move creates shared escalatory risk. The Germans really are the key in Europe on this because the Leopard 2, which is really what the Ukrainians want, uh, there are many Leopard 2s in Europe. There's a thriving spare parts market across the continent. The German tank should be arriving in weeks. The Abrams could take up to a year since the U.S. is manufacturing new ones for the Ukrainians. When the ground hardens again for the summer, we could see a major Ukrainian uh, offensive. Wednesday's announcement is a reversal of U.S. policy. The Biden administration has delivered dozens of packages of military aid, the latest totaling more than $5 billion in the last month alone. Together with our allies and partners, we've sent more than 3,000 armored vehicles, more than 8,000 artillery systems, more than 2 million rounds of artillery and ammunition, and more than 50 advanced multi-launch rocket systems. The Kremlin responded by calling the move blatant provocation. Wednesday, the Russian Defense Ministry released this video claiming to show a warship conducting hypersonic missile drills in western areas of the Atlantic Ocean. Ukrainian President Zelensky had requested up to 300 tanks. Yesterday, he tweeted his thanks to President Biden, now requesting F-16 fighter jets. Well, this could lead to some serious escalation. Uh, the Russians putting out that video, they're showing uh, tests in the ocean. And what that means is they're going to try to sink the tanks before they ever land in Europe. Uh, they want to cut off the supply line. So that's exactly what happened in World War II with the famous U-2 boats out of Germany trying to sink the supply ships going to Great Britain. Uh, this could escalate and get us into World War III. Ukraine is about to receive more than 30 M1 Abrams tanks from the U.S. military. That's a whole battalion of our most technologically advanced tank, tanks we said we would never send to Ukraine. Now we are. Germany, Poland, and the UK are also sending tanks to Ukraine. So what was going on here? Well, in a meeting of the Council of Europe yesterday, Germany's foreign minister casually mentioned that NATO has, in effect, declared war on Russia. Here's Annalena Baerbock explaining that World War III is already underway. 
I have said already in the last days, yes, we have to do more to defend Ukraine. Yes, we have to do more also on tanks. But the most important and the crucial part is that we do it together and that we do not do the blame game in Europe because we are fighting a war against Russia and not against each other. Now, you hate to go with cheap historical analogies, but since this conflict has been framed since day one by our idiot class as a replay of World War II, it is fair to point out it's been a long time since the Germans sent tanks into Ukraine. Didn't work well last time, probably won't this time either. But that's what NATO is planning, apparently. As numerous Biden officials have said in recent weeks, the goal is to take back Crimea. Now, wait a second. At the beginning, they said, let's just push Russia back to pre-February 2022 borders. That seemed kind of reasonable to most people, including us. But taking Russian Crimea from Russia, its essential port, well, Russia has said many times, and there's every reason to believe them, that would lead to nuclear war. But that's the new plan? Was this voted on? That's truly crazy. It seems as though we are on the verge of World War III. Jesus told us in the last days there would be war between the nations. Are we seeing the stage setting taking place to fulfill this prophecy? If so, then we're close to the time Jesus refers to as the worst time in the history of the world as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. If we are that close to the tribulation, then the world is about to see war the likes of this planet has never seen before. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal, war will be unleashed. Resulting from these wars will be famine, pestilence, and death as Jesus breaks the third and fourth seals. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6-8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion, meaning 2 billion people will die during this time. The remaining 17 judgments of God include devastating earthquakes, cosmic disturbances, scorching heat, meteors, 100-pound hailstones, volcanic eruptions, loathsome sores on those who take the mark of the beast, the seas, rivers, and springs of water turn to blood, demons torturing mankind, and a 200 million strong demonic army who will kill another third of mankind, bringing the total to 4 billion. A powerful winter storm is blanketing more than a dozen states with heavy snow, strong winds, and rain. The same system that brought tornadoes to the Gulf Coast knocked out power to thousands in Arkansas and Missouri. More than a half a foot of snow is already on the ground over a 900-mile stretch from Oklahoma to Michigan. Residents on the outskirts of Houston, they are, well, they're still picking up the pieces after a tornado tore an 18-mile-long path of destruction through the communities of Deer Park and Pasadena. Amid the destruction of homes like this, it's now confirmed that one of the tornadoes that touched down here was a powerful EF3, the first blow from a storm now delivering severe weather to the eastern part of the country. A midweek mess. More than a foot of heavy snow fell across parts of Arkansas, causing this truck to jackknife near Fayetteville and cutting power, leaving almost 100,000 people in the dark. Heavy snow blanketed Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and Missouri, where the governor declared a state of emergency. Please do not crowd and try to get around the snow plows. In Michigan, the snow led to several fatal accidents around Kalamazoo. Tonight, winter weather alerts stretch across 13 states, but not in Philadelphia or New York City, which haven't seen measurable snow since March of last year. In Texas, where the storm started, no shortage of frightening moments. Baby, come on. Come, come. Including heart stopping video from the city of Orange on the Louisiana border. A couple escaping their van as a tornado approached, seeking safety in a water filled ditch. Their dogs by their side. And here's what it looked like as a tornado ripped apart the Deer Park Community Center outside Houston. It was loud. It sounded like the building was shaking. We knew something was wrong the louder and louder it got. Now, the sound of cleaning up. <laughs> Heard all over the communities devastated. Wow, it's getting a little scary. By one of at least four tornadoes that touched down. Wow, wow. Dozens of homes damaged. I got a tree on my roof. 
as well as this animal shelter. And the National Weather Service says this is the first time it has ever issued what's called a tornado emergency for the Houston area. It's very rare. Fortunately, no lives were lost here. You may have heard the phrase, God's hand of protection. It seems that it is something God would do, keep a person or nation in the shelter of his hand. It also seems logical to think that in his fierce wrath and anger that he would lift his hand. But is it biblical? Yes, it is. Jeremiah 18, 7 through 10. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. In the news these days, we read about and see devastating events, each more unusual, destructive, and unprecedented than the last. They are happening more frequently and more intensely, just as the Bible said would happen just before the return of Jesus Christ. It seems as though God has lifted his hand of protection from the United States, and not just the U.S., but the world as well. These devastating events are not accidents, nor are they merely the natural cycle of things. The world is enduring events that are designed to bring about the end of days and cause us to repent. God is lifting his hand of protection from the nations of the world. No, things will never get back to normal. They will only get worse. As the birth pains continue to become more frequent and more intense, one has to wonder, how close are we to the rapture and the seven-year tribulation? Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12, And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. Two teenagers who were killed when a gunman opened fire inside this alternative high school in Iowa have been identified. Des Moines police say 16-year-old Rashad Carr and 18-year-old Gianni Dameron were both students at the school. A third person who was shot was William Holmes, also known as Will Keeps, a rapper and activist who was the director of the school called Starts Right Here. He remains at the hospital after having surgery for his injuries. Police arrested 18-year-old Preston Walls and charged him with first-degree murder, attempted murder, and gang participation. Cops say the killings are believed to be part of an ongoing gang dispute. They say their investigation found that 16 minutes prior to the shooting, Walls cut off an ankle monitor he was wearing as part of a pretrial release condition in connection with a previous weapons charge. Walls' bail was set at more than $2 million. He has not entered a plea to the charges against him, and he's scheduled to be back in court next month. Despite a suspect being in custody, the community will be shaken by this incident for some time. It's a sad story that we talk about far too often, you know, and this is, we're, we're losing a generation of kids, and uh, we, we've got, as a community, to get our arms wrapped around it. One of the many signs we are living in the last days is people would be brutal, as we read in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. A TV weatherman pays a heavy price for being a good Samaritan. My ribs are all kind of bruised up. Adam Klotz is a meteorologist on the Fox News Channel. Currently, those winds are at 125 miles an hour. He was on a New York subway at 1 a.m. when he says he saw half a dozen teenagers hassling an elderly passenger. 
Klotz says one of the teens lit a joint and used the lighter to set the man's hair on fire. The outraged meteorologist says when he told them to knock it off, they turned on him. They decided, all right, if he's not going to get it, then you're going to get it. And boy, did they give it to me. Klotz posted uh, this video ground. right after the attack. I spoke to Klotz today. And I caught a left hook, a pretty good one, and then I end up on the ground and I'm getting stomped on. So I was just really doing my best to like protect my head and my neck. Reign of terrors, says the New York Post front page. Cops arrested three teenagers, but they were not charged and were later released. And that's sparking outrage. They could have killed him. They could have knocked him out and set his hair on fire. Yep, and they're walking free. Tonight, two paramedics charged with the first degree murder of Earl Moore Jr. pleading not guilty in an Illinois court. State investigators say Peter Cadigan and Peggy Finley strapped Moore face down on a stretcher during a hospital transport, causing his death. Body camera video from December shows Springfield police officers responding to a call apparently involving people inside of a home with firearms. There's no one here with guns. Okay. He's hallucinating. He's having alcohol withdrawals. But after arriving, officers realized the caller needed medical assistance and requested an ambulance. You want that water? Paramedics arrived about 15 minutes later. Sit up. Oh, man. What happened? Oh. Refusing to offer more medical assistance, according to the police. We ain't carrying him. I am seriously not in the mood for this gun. Officers help Moore through the home. Tomorrow, get you some help, bud. Lifting him onto the stretcher, where Cadigan is then seen placing him face down. Prosecutors say the two paramedics then tightly strapped him in. Moore, just 35 years old, died about an hour later. His death ruled a homicide. Cause of death as compressional and positional asphyxia. Attorneys for both defendants deny any wrongdoing. Finley's attorney telling NBC News her response that night can't in any way be considered a criminal act. Moore's family disagrees. They tied him down like some kind of animal mm. and killed him. My baby suffocated. A case now heading to trial, both paramedics facing up to 60 years in prison. One of the many signs that we're living in the end times is the epidemic of wickedness and violence that is sweeping the world today. Jesus tells us when society parallels the days of Noah, he will return as we read in Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So what was going on in Noah's day that parallels our day? To find out the answer, we need to go back to the book of Genesis 6, 5 through 13. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. There is no doubt about the hour in which we live being the season for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ as we link Matthew 24, verses 12 and 37 through 39 with 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. The Bible describes our day very clearly from these scriptures. The condition of wickedness and violence that caused the earth to be destroyed in Noah's day is the same condition our earth is in today. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world, as we know it, is near. For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, 
you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A, admit that you're a sinner. B, believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C, call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what? If his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning, my prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.